I took a ride outside these walls and I found the reason for all of those tall tales about the fall. I took a ride. To tell the truth, I was caught in a life of crime, giving up and escaping all the time. To tell the truth, I'm through with denial as a way to make my way back up the Nile. I see the smile on the Sphinx, Cleopatra winks, and as she closed her eyes, I read between the lashes on painted lips, hieroglyphs that said we were distracted, we spent too long being addicts, change your minds. There's more going on inside than any sleep device. With bells, whistles, and lights can hide. between the lashes Over the decade our attention has decayed into this void I wake to remember my feet the place we used to meet Are you still annoyed? It's no mystery to get away from the prison of screens Attacking the simulacra of the Anthropocene Rush to defend her In a gesture of surrender Feathered wings She moves at the speed of light Through with breadth, depth and height And soon they will announce Take a ride. Take a ride outside these walls. Take a ride. Take a ride outside these walls. We'll take a ride outside these walls. Take a ride. Take a ride outside these walls. Take a ride. Together behind four walls. Together.
So this is Francis, and uh, this is a little poem about um, my nephew, my great nephew, uh, who's called William. Uh, it was kind of inspired by a photograph that my niece sent me, uh, and it's called Cordoned Off. An empty space where cries of happiness would normally call out, where parents normally watched their brood as they ran about, with a whir of energy. A boy looks on, trying to rationalise it all. Surveying what is his normal domain. Oh, William, what are you thinking? In that deep, thoughtful head of yours, as swings lay static, locked and motionless. Perhaps a bird calls out, or there is the occasional murmur of traffic. Even the sky shouts emptiness. All lies dormant. Installation one. The light is off. The light is on. The slow growing glow gradually defeats and resolves the retreating darkness and slinking shadows, reforming to allow their hidden, ready-made replacement entities concrete. Installation two. Shake off the enveloping sheet and still half a sheep. Cast them off and without luster or fluster. Calmly take the stairway down to the other parallel adjacent world. The one below in the quiet and still silent. The stair by your own tippy toe, tiptoe feet. Installation three. With one's hair an unmade bed, hear the rushing torrent, a click, an elemental warming, the frantically seeding bubbles hot head warning, and an embrocation mix fill the yawning hole in, and calm placate the raw palate with an introductory imbibing intermediate. Installation four. I stare at the bricks and the smoke coils lazily, drifts up and away. A white twisting, cavorting, intoxicating dance that glides high, then dissimulates as if the display, so temporary, was possibly just nothing, never extraordinary, an elusive idea, a short-lived theme, a dream, no matter, just ethereal and transitory and ephemeral being. Installation 5 Evacuation becomes imminent, we must move quickly and leave. Arrive at the evacuation facility, please. There, two 
form an orderly queue made up entirely of only you, ready to unembrace, to disengage and release another satisfying bit of dodgy do. And all this with a knowing but desultory nod or two to Duchamp's emigrammatical and enigmatic Waterloo. The Longest Journey She's never been one for the crowded places. The town squares with their fountains and their tourists, the pedestrianised areas thronging with shoppers, the pubs full of drinkers spilling out onto the streets. No, she likes the quiet, the wild spaces. Mountains and moors scratched with heather, rasping at your ankles. Waves crashing on a rocky shore. An empty beach spooling out in front of her tramping boots. Now she is inside. She is one of the vulnerable. Her door must stay locked. Death lies just over the threshold. Over there, outside. Her flat is dark, small, a bad conversion in a Victorian tenement. It smells of basement and of damp. It didn't matter before. It was where she dumped her bags, rested between trips, a stopover place. She never meant it to become her world. The view from her kitchen sink is of the courtyard, a pokey, dirty space, originally designed for coal deliveries, all blackened bricks and dead leaves. There is only a postage stamp of sky. She feels the sadness creeping in, all the losses, all the regrets, the times when she should have stepped into an embrace but held back, awkward. The times when she should have smiled and said, I love you, but it was too diffident. The many times when shyness overcame her and the moment was lost. And the other times when she was shunned or rejected or harassed all those times crowd into her head until all she can do is crawl under the covers, curl into a ball and sleep and sleep and sleep. On the fourth day of sleep, she drags herself from bed to bathroom and then to kettle. And as she waits for it to boil, she looks out into the courtyard. Prison yard, she thinks. The high walls, the patch of sky. <laughs> There's a bin bag blown in from the street, caught in the drain. If it rains, that'll flood, she thinks. She makes herself unlock the door, push hard and step out in her flip-flops into the air. It's dank and dark, of course. But it isn't the rank air of her bedroom. And there is light filtering down. She tugs at the bin bag, frees the drain, and then, like a prisoner, she steps along the edge of the yard. Ten steps. She runs her fingertips over the rough texture of the rough brick. Ten more steps across the back, then ten again, and ten back to the door, a square of 40 steps. A step is about two and a half feet. 2,000 steps makes one mile. 10,000 is five miles. She knows this. It is enough. On that first day, she walks around the area five times, the air 
fills her lungs and although she goes back to her bed and retreats into the dark, her head is beginning to fill with other images, other thoughts. And when she wakes the next morning, she gets straight out of bed. She has a plan. She finds the old tin of white paint that is hidden at the back of a cupboard and a paintbrush that has hardened with lack of use. She levers open the tin and there's plenty of paint, plenty as she sloshes it on the walls of the area, plenty to make it white. It doesn't matter that the paint splatters on the ground and it doesn't matter that it might peel off in a few months or become stained green with mould. What matters is that now the walls are bright and white and she has a canvas. She finds her ordnance survey maps. She chooses one to begin. It is her favourite. She steps out into the courtyard. She starts at the pub in the village and walks through free fields until she gets to the edge of the moor. She climbs up the steep slope, her feet finding footholds in the rocky footpath. She meets the burn and puts her hand into the peaty water, splashing her face to cool it. Oh, she doesn't smell the new paint now, but the fragrance of heather coming into bloom, the coconut smell of yellow gorse and the crystal clear air of the hilltop. That morning, her limbs feel heavy and tired from the exercise, but her brain feels sharper than it has for days. She feels the need to mark her walk, to record it as a prisoner might. She has oil paints brought for a project long discarded. Standing in front of the shining white walls, she paints the new purple blush of the heather which covers the moor. The second day is an oak tree, stunted and bent by the wind. And on the third day, she paints a hare, guarding its leveret in the grass. By the third week, she looks out of her kitchen window to a wild space thronging with life, with green, with mountains, with birds, with rocks and caves, with sky. She looks out into a landscape of freedom. She rings her mother. Hi mum, she says. I've been on the longest journey. Hi there, my name's Harry Weiss Jones and this is an abridged version of my poem for Together Behind Four Walls. Um, it's called Faith Versus Apathy, Hope Versus Despair. So uh, here it goes. Set alight with fresh sensation, can it be anticipation that tears straight through a dull blank stare of a cynic's boredom that induced this comatose faithless reverie? But against the grain of the usual strain, compassion's single tear fell in torrents and left me drenched, ice cold, then doused with boiling thunder, finally wrenched and roused me from a malaise stoked slumber, an ice cold jolt caressed with warm surprise, a long deserved assault that awoke all three of my eyes, though I must confess I'd long since surmised that all my spirits, stone dead, cured and salted lies, served up upon a table, another course of apathy to sate an insatiable machine. If each facet of a mirror long since shattered could show the gazer how he got so battered, where routine made mincemeat of all that mattered, until resigned to resignation solitude, he saw victory and defeat. Convinced all he saw was truly all it seems, a generation led by memes, not dreams. The mind's inexplicable near infinite vastness, paling beside a phone's cheek, shiny sharpness, stuck like stigmata to our palm. Surely tepid stimulation could do no harm. Why should eyes be made of water, and our memory spoke aloud? Nature sighs at the gifts we brought her a much less nourishing apple and a subterranean dwelling cloud. 
Cloud Witch launches, not to Helen's ships, but 10,000 falsely filtered faces, running from envy to envy in online races, eternal self and an eternal ether, so keen to put pain to death that we're forgetting how to live. So much beauty shared for ugly reasons, accumulating to merge the seasons, one by one we join the legions, monetizing all we are, raping reality with unreal pictures, escaping life's banality with far more banal fixtures, like the myriad vapid space set rom-coms and the rapid race to get yet more mod cons hides the fact our only evolution is that our blood's now pumped by stone. Is there a shade more blood or a flood more beauty that when his cold kiss threatens we get some sense of duty? That was actually when in bound in peacetime we danced and marched to a far more hellish din. To wake or rest mildly entertained by a psychotic reel of daily pain at best a minute's indignance clearly feigned if our cheek is wet and salty, it's just because we're at the gym. Watching children bleeding on the streets, cities stricken, shuddering to missiles beats. Murderers ranked by sky in constant heats. Parts of a civilised routine. While papers editors plead for calm, with daily death tolls and panic buying, there's no need for such alarm. Of course it's a noble service, as truth needs telling, and it's just happenstance, there's tenfold selling. Buy the present with the proceeds of the future selling. As we built our house upon a fence, weep not for the fact that we've got so dense, we're told to do what's right through fear, not sense. Yet as both the velvet of the future and the foundations it would line, shatter, crumble into grains so small, so fine, it flows, ripples, even drips like tears of melted gossamer, bright enough to dull a diamond shine, cascading into a river of wind. When darts resignation tempts like a siren calling, when we all are forced to contemplate our falling, our plans in tatters from a savage mauling, Facing the daunting heart of the matter, we take our dusty heart from off the shelf. And as it starts to beat again, the pain assaults our sense again. I was told, remember to remember, there is no best without the worst. Once we're isolation and boredom strangling, but now on a precipice we all are dangling. Have you noticed how there's much less petty wrangling, now there's reasons for such an anxious tone? This choking, nearly universal worry forced us to halt our daily ant-like scurry. May bind a generation who exchanged calm for hurry. It's the wolf that's howling at the door that's made life's true riches known. This pain necessitates empathy. Is that a worthwhile gain for all that misery? One saw in another's eyes the same pain looked back. They felt this pain's most divine aspect. Somewhere in the path of self-preservation found this thing called empathy. Suffering builds a daunting prison. Walls of jagged blades cutting all with such precision. To dress your wounds or theirs a hard decision. Even more so when you're all in fetters and they'll say I'm fine now let me be. But here's a secret barely whispered, only when your arms are truly bound and your blood turned to lead will you muster the strength to wrench them free, and the shackles shatter and in place of torment's fetters is freedom's ecstasy. And though many may yet weep at the last post played, the first toast spilt, when the flowers are laid and promptly wilt, unkempt and lonely grows the grave even as the pristine banks get built, and some may live a blessed lifetime yet scowl at all they did not obtain. Another's time is all in strife and squalor, yet they see the sparkle of an angel's teardrops in every drop of rain. Of course it's true we must distract from the incongruous absurd daunting fact of death's temporal curse that on one day nearly all shall lay most lad likely cl clad in a best shirt lined with flowers riding in the eternal footman's hearse yet if the mountains and seas can talk and feel discuss the links connecting all that's real and with us laugh or cry at this enforced deal be sure they would envy us that curse for us beyond dispute the universe's magic is made far more su sweeter by our fate so tragic we career at lightning speed, though we feel we're static, yet all we know, all our immeasurable knowledge, equates to some flickering shadows dancing on just one wall of a single cave, while outside resides all the wonders and mysteries of the earth, the galaxy, the universe, and the space between and beyond. Within our four walls, all we see of the stars are, are the sparks and crackles from that fire inside our cave. Hi, I'm Leela Soma, a writer from Glasgow. I want to thank Francis Powell um, for Together Behind the Four Walls and to Paris Lit Up for um, uh, uh, entertaining this event um, on COVID and COVID poems as such. Um, I have four poems to read, quite short ones. I'll start with the first one called Pen. Pen, there's a quotation first. The pen is the tongue of the mind, Miguel de Cervantes. The letters of the alphabets fuse the color in. 
a black and white landscape of wounds and pain. Words I wish to use as naked as I want them to be in these strange times of the pandemic. Voices float from the television, gowns, PPE, gloves, random numbers creep up every day. The incredible daily toll of infections, death and graphs, as families behind those figures mourn their loved ones, words become silent. I circle the days in the COVID-19 diary, add words, a shine of words on a blank page, bury feelings. Time passes like the still waters of the pond, a hush, then a flow as I untie the bond of words. Ordinary events of birth, marriage, illness, old age and death have a new meaning in this silent world. Outside, the window, outside the window, birds chirp, leaves dance in the wind, the sun shines. Would I be able to breathe life into words? The next poem is called Glove. Gloved hands against the glass, the same hands, marigolded, cleaned the dishes, dusted the house, shined windows with newspaper and vinegar, each task done to perfection, pride in work, a life of love, hands that cuddled me, the breath of my life. From the bed, I watch helpless, breathless, brittle and broken as they wheel me to the ICU. I wish, I wish, I wish I could touch that hand once more. The next poem is called Sorrow. Sorrow has an elegance, a colorless canvas, shades of aquarelle, pale in their grief, denial, then anger. Why me? The heart asks, as it searches for the familiar and clothes, a faint smell on the pillow, seeking solace and prayers, bereft, Tears flow unknowingly, the void remains. The blue of the coronard lungs, veined as a scar, buried in the recesses of the soul. Unspeaking, volumes muted, alphabets unstrung, words become superfluous. Loss tied to words, a language which with, with which we learn to laugh, talk, cry, and mourn. Orphaned words, hushed, a quiet numb, heartaches, the hurt waiting for time to heal. And the last um, poem was written well before, a, a month before Christmas. Um, and it reflects that. The title is Claps, Claps, 35 claps to Christmas. How we count our days now. Surreal to imagine the fairy lights on dark November nights, shops ablaze, people fighting over new toys. Days stretch as we look out the window, watch an empty sun streaked street, itch to go out and drive to the coast. Feel the sea breeze on our skin, dig our toes in the hot sand as we lick a 99 cone. Images that seem out of reach, yet this may be a transient entire phase, a golden time to be with our loved ones, spend hours baking, playing Monopoly, listening to each other, understanding that our basic need is love, kindness, and more love. Thank you for listening to me. This is just a wee sketch poem written yesterday, another day of lockdown. When that daily walk becomes an almost sacred thing, I think the poem is pretty self-explanatory. 
The Daily Ration In the bare car park, a father is teaching his son to unicycle. Little boy is all a flap, trying his balance on the air. Soon he is winging it, engrossed and delighted, pedalling, then catching the ball, throwing it back. The father can speed up, slow down, back pedal, scoop up the ball like a polo player. Tomorrow the child will do likewise. Meanwhile, his sister is perfecting her keepy-uppies, counting into herself, enthralled, happy to tolerate a younger brother, unfazed by a father in shorts without his usual tie. They teeter, but do not fall. Time to pedal forwards, wordless, back into the world. This particular series I entitled Corona Beer Diaries and uh, a part of that series is also diary number three uh, entitled for my friend Virna Teixeira who translated everything into Portuguese and was the first one like myself to get Corona COVID symptoms in March 2020. I have just returned from the visit to the Dr. B. He refused to give me the test as he observed my symptoms. Aha, you answered all my questions positive. So take the prescription against this ailment and go to the pharmacy. Stay in bed for two weeks and call me back. He must have been scared for my further visit. At the pharmacy next to my quarantined home, all the pharmacists were protected by a glass shield. A young fellow who was particularly caring announced, don't worry, just take the medication and go back home safely. In two weeks, you will develop the antibodies and you will be okay. I went back home, but then I looked into my mirror. My face was as white as Alexander Saran's one day before he died in a hospital. However, on that last day of his life, he was cool and kind and loving, professional above all. He wrote a blurb for my book under the sign of Cyber Sibylle. What a bright example of how a poet should behave. Then numerous phone calls have started to flood in. Four of my former husbands have called, basically, they all had to say something, to say the same thing. Call number one. The snazzy and soft voice of my number one has declared, Oh, I just wanted to see how you're doing. I meant to tell you, hmm. I always wanted to tell you that I have always loved you and cared for you from the start. This is not a final call, but I just want you to know I apologize for everything. I said, for what, sweets? Well, if I had said or done anything wrong to you, just to tell you how much I love you. Oh, thank you. I love you too. Call number two. Hi, I haven't heard from you for a while and Every dynamic voice of husband number two exclaimed, that's because I've been so busy dealing with all these insane people. However, you know that I love you, right? I always loved you. And even now, as of this very moment, if you ever wanted to come back to me, you know, my doors, that is my heart is always open. How do you feel? Fine, I answered, a bit tired, but I'll be okay. You'd better be okay, he added. You know we are supposed to meet in London in three months. That gives us enough time to recover. This is just to tell you I apologize for everything. Yes, I said, what for, sweets? Oh, well, if I had said or done anything wrong to you, just to tell you now how much I love you. Oh, thank you. I love you too. Call number three. Hello, my dearest queen of hearts. 
The exuberant voice of number three was penetrating my ear through the accent receiver on my iPhone. I'm calling you, as I have noticed that you posted some alarming notices on your Facebook page. Is it all true? What's wrong with you, your health now? And not allowing me for a second to respond to his numerous requests, he continued, I hope you clean your environment and I do hope that your son is helping you a bit. That is, I hope that he's well, safe and sound. Everyone is okay over here, I respond, and I truly hope that you take care of yourself, as your health has been ever fragile ever since. Oh, he continued, this is just to tell you, I apologize for everything. And yes, I said, for what, sweet? Well, if I had said or done anything wrong to you, just to tell you how much I love you. Oh, thank you, thank you, I love you too. I added and wish him good evening, morning time that it was on my side of the planet. Call number four. Hello, yes, it's me. No one else but your silly mini-me who has been really worried, I interrupted him, about state of the planet in general and my health in particular. There you go. He answered, and having detected these tired overtones in my voice, he continued. Do these doctors do anything good for you over here? Yes, they do, I replied, but they must be really overworked and awfully exhausted themselves. Huge epidemics advances. And my dear, how are you? Yes, I know, the most reasonable of them four replied. Yes, I'm a bit on a sickly side too, and my sister is even in a worse condition than I'm right now. But this is just to tell you, I apologize for everything. I said, what for, sweets? Well, if I said or had done anything wrong to you, just to tell you now how much I love you. Oh, thank you, I love you too. I had no further time to continue the conversation, as also all these calls appeared a bit repetitive to me. I could not even remember why I had ever parted from J or even from K, for that matter, whereas T and M were plainly not compatible. But sweet that unpredictable this time. I also refused to believe that they called in order to redeem their own spiritual selves from darkness. I will be okay. I will be okay. Now that all of us walked along the steep path of forgiveness, I went back to my bed and turned the radio on. The heroic symphony boomed from it. All of us need that extra encouragement from time to time. Each of our homes is wrapped in the insolence of tasks badly done. And the same re-found lists run over again and re-run. This is a, a little dark poem I wrote. Um, it's called Unity, and it starts a bit like this. Empty trains going nowhere. Churches where choirs don't sing. A lonely Gothic opera. A party with no people, the sign of silence. The doorbell never rings. Open roads that lead to oblivion. Find a way, yes, find a way. Windows that look out to emptiness. Doors that lead to a nothingless void. A restaurant open to nobody, the cook's food left to rot and fester, queens with meaningless speeches, with crowns upon their heads, banishing jesters from their sacred palaces. Dust gathering in schools and parks, dreamers walking round in hope, lovers capturing moments together, heroes sitting about their work, caring for those in need. Gods looking down on human chaos, birds building nest, nests, joggers turning in circles, dogs pulling their owners in all kinds of directions. 
aged souls wondering what is happening. How can this be? Recrimination, pointed fingers. Can we all do better? Where's the hope? Where is the way out? Businessmen fussing and fretting as their money drains away. As one day turns into another, the news tells us a new story. Planes grounded, the homeless hunting for a haven, the afflicted turning their thoughts in their minds, the waves still crashing on empty shores, wanderers wandering forever. Welcome to the lost tribe of Nirvana, my dear. Beggars looking for scraps of food, children bored, nothing to do, mindless television, time moves on slowly. Pick up the pieces from all the remains and find your inner soul. Come on, mankind, pull yourself together. Hello, hello. This is Professor Elemental uh, for Paris Lit Up. Oh, to be in Paris now instead of my bunker. Uh, still, I am surrounded by toys, comics, and a large amount of cake, so I can't complain too much. I have done a poem for Behind Four Walls, uh, but this is a different poem dedicated to everybody who is behind four walls. All of us, in fact. You're not the tallest or the strongest or the fastest or the cleverest. Legends last long but not forever, so remember this. We're all together, so don't be frightened. He who knows least is most enlightened. It might be that ignorance is bliss. It's inherently ridiculous we even exist. So why be inconspicuous a reasonable risk just to give it all in? It's as easy as this. Ah. Isn't that all better? Better than a call centre till it's all pallbearers? We're all aware of all of life's treasures and how little life's left lets all hoard pleasure. Set sail, all walls, all weather. Odd individuals look awesome together. We are all in together. Thanks, chaps. Um, I look forward to seeing you in the flesh one day soon. But until then, back to the cake, I suppose. Cheerio! Oh, to be a toad, to squat, dank and squelch, to shuffle in mud. Frog sounds best. Toad, while you both are monosyllabic, frog hops with fricative hope. While you, toad, while you sink in tone. Oh, toad. I heard a story once about a toad who dined on slugs and lunched on snails. But what one man calls squalid is a French coat of tails. Oh toad, with your toes wallowed deep in a puddly home, certainly I am not talking to a toad. But I saw one jump once from fear as my two big boots splashed over her mire. So no, you are not a toad. You weep at the looming shadow of a boot you call fate. But you don't, won't, can't, jump. Tu n'es pas un crapaud. Le crapaud de mes souvenirs sautait de sa flaque d'eau sous l'ambre de mes trop grandes bottes. Alors que toi, cette ambre, tu la nommes destin. Et tu pleures d'une tristesse plus profonde que toute flaque d'eau. Et tu ne peux pas, tu ne sais plus, sauter. Croak, said the toad, I'm hungry, I think, but today I've had nothing I'm but afraid. a toad to drink. I'm afraid I'll I'm crawl sick. into the garden and jump through the rails, and there I'll sup finally on the slugs and on snails. I'm afraid I'm
Stop. Your conquest of this forest ends now. You cannot face my strength while the moon glows. My cubs and chicks are hungry for meat and milk. Thrice I woke in the moon glow after the great slumber with my children screaming of the end times, locust swarms and tree death. Once again my children's squeaks have brought me back. The first time it was the dwarves, carrying hammers like that one there except uncloaked, smashing clutches and carting off shell pieces to wear on their shields and armor, dozens of eggs. Six times I returned home to a raided nest, the shells completely gone, but what was left, yellow yolk and half-formed chicks trampled under dwarven boots. When I woke next, it was for the humans. From Dagenthor they came for the feathers. Hunters with spears would kill and pluck the young ones. I would find batches of them, too, their naked red flesh, and I'd nuzzle them with my beak to see what life remained. Each time, a few lived without feathers, but the survivors were broken and could no longer draw strength from the moon. They bred in the manner of bears, but I do not share a link to these offspring who have swelled to take the forest. I rose in my rage against a convoy of poachers, and three wizards shot me with lightning from wands, and the forest cackled and burned, but we killed them and feasted on their magic blood. When the forest was safe, I licked my wounds clean and slept again. Now I have awoken a third time, and it is the elves carrying my young to the volcano in cages. In visions I see the elves twisting my hatchlings with whips and sulfur fumes and old rune craft. I will rise against them too, these new tormentors, and they will see how my strength has grown. But first, behold, my three enemies, a human, elf, and dwarf. Warring over ages, one race against another, you find common ground in killing my children, smashing them and plucking them and torturing them. I have only wanted them to be whole, to have full lives in the mountain shadow. Once again you return to crush my dreams and steal my children's magic. My powers have returned and I fear no blade of steel. Who among you is here to return the shells, the feathers, the children? Where are you hiding the children? We walked up a mountain, my son and I to breathe the fresh air and reach for the sky. I ran from the virus, the crowds and the vice, the negative news, the fear and the lies. I ran from machines, computers and phones, our little boxed lives in our little boxed home. My son took his homework called Fahrenheit, no poetry learning or old fashioned rhymes, a tale of dystopia in modern times, with questions to answer and grades to revise. As we climbed up that mountain with no great intent, few aspirations a little to vent, our sweat from the incline just vaporized all my negative judgments, my need to recall a day when I felt like hope was still dawning. Oh, come on, it still does, at sunrise each morning. And my Canadian childhood began to awaken. Skating and running on ice, feeling vacant. <laughs> on that mountain up high, we finally stopped. We lay in the snow and let everything flop. We listen to silence. Nature in the flow, doing whatever, no questions, all go. With wide open spaces, the picture gets bigger. The options seem less, I'm sure we can figure. Do we walk to the summit or stay bathed in sweat? Do we follow like sheep or wait and see what's next? Let's run riot, says Maxwell. Oh, my son's on fire. I want to ski down that mountain. I want to fly even higher than that peak over yonder. Come on. 
It's my real desire, Mum. Thank God for budgets, I can safely say no. You save your dream to be James Bond in the snow. Call me Pooh Bear. Yeah, in the now, tiddly palm, let's stay put. Meditate on the towel, then we'll go back by foot. When my teenager's bouncing on oxygen, this tigger, blood full of hormones, a vim and much vigor, a wham and a bam, two snowballs in the face. I'm forced to take arms, this kid's on my case, like Alice who falls down with a deep dark hole. I slide, OMG, I'm out of control. Snow down the bum and right up the back. We've slipped down the mountain. Can we stay on track? Life is now flowing like a fountain while arms are askew, legs flailing like babies. But the joy that does ensue. We're screaming like banshees. Well, really just me. No police in the snow checking identities, no. There's no tut-tuts. Look at her, imagine at the age of 53. Hmm. No control, no cares. A sense of being free. We walked up that mountain, my son and I, to breathe fresh air and reach for the sky. Just a mom and her son having fun in the snow in a mountain so special. Simple, eh? Have a go. Study in chrome yellow. Alone and philosophical, I prefer, I think, to remain apart from the world. Only one bright ribbon of sunlight showing in my dim domain. All circumstance to the interior Everything else, noise, configuration, cause, traceable to a clue, an errant speculation. Food rested in bed and love by surprise. Connection to anyone is severed, except as it occurs. And it does, daily, profoundly, lacking only pattern and rights, presumption, purpose in earnest. This poem is called to a suitcase. Me, myself and I sit in the corner of a white room made of corners. Here no one can see very far. I speak to the sky, a blue square in the window frame. It doesn't reply. I talk to objects, a painting, a rug. They haven't much to say. Except for one, a suitcase. Restless in the winter cupboard dark. Beloved, dead beige, kicked about old faithful. If you could speak, you chuckle, joyful you. So dawning on me open, I hear you yawn at daybreak. And into joyful you I stuff some green paprikas. A moustache that tickles. A red scarf to wave when dancing. The briefest of bikini bottoms, only bottoms, and I don't care if I bulge. I throw in leaves and goats untethered, feelings and a man's fingertips. 
I throw in an Irish island where seals sing all night long, where no one can finish a song for laughing. I throw out oughts and shoulds and thoughts that I am good or bad. I will not take you down that straight and rusty road, dead beige beloved. But you and I will cruise around the curly ones, the crooked ones, where witches squawk, where businessmen go naked but for ribbons, where philosophers all wear flippers, where doors fly open, where locks are broken, where prisoners run wild across the open fields like horses, where women with silver in their hair dance under a hungry moon, where you never ever know what's round the bend, where wanderers bust their guts laughing at nothing funnier than the smell of spring.